In these times of uncertainty, it's all the more important that we keep collaborating, informing and inspiring each other, so that we can be smarter and better tomorrow. Welcome to the Pakhuis de Zwijger livecast. Hello everyone, on behalf of Pakhuizen Zwijger, welcome to the live cast about emerging stories. My name is Rut Kronenburg and I'm your host of today. This is already the 17th edition of Emerging Stories, the talk show about the future and the importance of independent journalism. Especially during these very uncertain and sometimes crazy times, access to reliable information is even more important than ever. In this series, we're going to dive into the different aspects of journalism. Uh, we touch upon the problems and we try to come up with solutions. And we do that with international guests. We talk with media experts, with journalists, with photographers, etc. They share with us their emerging stories and the importance of independent journalism. And today we're going to talk about the importance of uh, uh, online communities, the shift from offline to online. And why should journalists actually focus on building online communities? We do that with three guests. Today um, in the studio, I have Corina de Vries. Corina, welcome. Thank you. And via Zoom, we have Miss Julie Possetti. And we also have oh. Lee and Olvage. Corina, thank you for joining us in the studio. Yes. How are you? I'm fine. It's been busy times for journalism. Yes, especially in the local uh, newspapers. Definitely. Yes. Definitely. So uh, you're the um, editor in chief of a media house of local newspapers, mainly in the northwest of the Netherlands, yes, right? Yes, correct. Uh, what does it entail? Um, well, um, I have five newspapers. Um, the biggest are uh, uh, North Holland's Dagblad. Leids Dagblad van de City of Leiden, Haarlem's Dagblad van de City of Haarlem en Gooi Neemlander, Hilversum in the middle of the Netherlands. And um, we have uh, quite a large subscription number, um, uh, 168,000. Uh, so we reach uh, um, uh, a lot of people every day. And this is mainly print subscription or also online? It's um, mainly print and uh, we uh, only a year ago we started uh, also uh, getting digital subscriptions and premium subscriptions. And with us it's only 10% of our uh, subscribers are purely digital. Um, so there's a huge market for us to grow. That's how I see it. Okay, so this topic uh, has your interest for definitely, sure. Definitely, definitely. Okay. Julie, um, you're uh, the director of research of the International Center for Journalism. Um, what does that precisely entail? Are you just doing research? <laughs> um, no, I'm a, I've been a journalist for 30 years, so uh, I'm still actively uh, doing journalism whenever I can often in the form of um, analysis of issues uh, central to the future of journalism. Um, and my research at um, the International Centre for Journalists, ICFJ, um, I just began a year ago. It's a new division at ICFJ, and we started a research division um, focused on um, the future of journalism because we felt that it was important to um, ensure that there was evidence-based um, uh, data um, to support uh, the future of journalism so that we're not um, just flailing around trying to respond to crisis after crisis. So the idea is to marry traditional academic research. I'm an academic, I have a PhD in, uh, in the area of um, protecting uh, sources of journalism uh, in the digital context actually, right. um, but I'm also a journalist as I said for, for many uh, decades now. And, and you're practicing um, also journalism? Say that again. Are you still practicing journalism? Yes. So, as I said, I, I tend to report um, on issues that are critical to the future of journalism. So I uh, write about um, freedom of expression challenges, human rights issues as they intersect with digital rights um, and journalism. 
Um, so I'm, I'm published um, regularly as a, as a commentator, uh, as well as a, um, a reporter. So yes, I still practice. I think that's very important to note that those of us who um, study the future of journalism should be actively engaged uh, with the communities that we are representing or studying. Um, and those communities for us are the communities of journalism and their audiences. Right. And you're based in the UK. And what is the situation at the moment in the UK? Is it as bad as here in the Netherlands? <laughs> Corona-wise, I mean. <laughs> yeah, I'm based in Oxford um, in the UK. And uh, the situation here both in terms of uh, living through a pandemic is very familiar, I'm sure, um, to, to, to those in Europe. Um, uh, the situation is just as difficult, uh, but it's also um, difficult for journalism and for particularly local media um, in, the, in the UK. Uh, so I hope you know, we get to talk about building communities in, the, in, the, in a time of crisis um, as well today. Absolutely, we will. So thank you for sharing. In a bit, we're going to dive deeper into this subject. But first, we're going to hear what the people on the street have to say about this. Our flying reporter went to the street again to ask passersby the following question. Journalists make choices every day about what is covered and what not. And what not. Do you think that they are making the right choices or would you want to influence them? And if so, how? Let's have a look. Nou, ik wil geen contact hebben met journalisten. Daar zit ik niet op te wachten. Maar de invloed zou ik wel eens willen hebben. Ja, dat is, maar dat kan dus niet, hè? Want ik zit wel eens wat te lezen en dan denk ik, verdorie, je vergeet dit. Of god, dat zou ik ook wel willen weten. En uh, ja, dat, uh, dat hoor ik of lees ik dan niet. En uh, dat vind ik dan jammer. Uh, nee, want dan uh, ga ik me begeven in hun gebied. En een journalist die moet voor zichzelf weten wat hij doet. Daar is hij voor opgeleid en dat is een vak, en daar hoef ik hem niet te vertellen. Uh, ja, dat is wel interessant om contact met ze te hebben, want zij zijn natuurlijk als eerst op de hoogte van nieuwe ontwikkelingen. Uh, vooral nu, uh, met de corona-omstandigheden en antisiekhuisopnamen. Dus dat is wel fijn om op de hoogte te zijn over de ontwikkelingen, hoe de stand van zaken zijn. Nou ja, ik vind dat ze het goed doen. Soms. <laughs> maar uh, contact hoef ik er niet mee te hebben. Ik, uh... Ik, uh, ieder heeft zijn eigen werk. Nou ja, weet je, ik weet natuurlijk niet waar de keuze uitgemaakt wordt. Daar zou ik wel eens een beetje achter de schermen willen kijken. Van, uh, waar kiezen jullie dan uit? Populair nieuws? Of nieuws wat niet zo erg uh, ernstig is? Of juist wel? Of te meer sensatie? Of uh, de kleine dingen blijven nu op de plank liggen omdat het allemaal... Uh, zo groot en uh, nou ja, ernstig is. Het hangt af van, uh, van het nieuwsmedium, eerlijk gezegd. Uh, NOS is bijvoorbeeld, vind ik, heel, heel betrouwbaar. Maar uh, ja, de, uh, er zijn ook gekleurde meningen en, en ja, beïnvloeding van. En dat staat me tegenwoordig niet zo aan. Ik dag altijd ik, uh, kanaal en journaal kijken. Uh, en uh, soms uh, CNN kijken, ja. Horen of de horen wat is gebeurd, ja. Alleen uh, voor mij vervelende oorlog, ja. Uh, nou, nee, ik heb uh, niet zo te zeggen, maar het nieuws wat ze brengen is natuurlijk goed. Ik bedoel, het gaat over uh, algemene zaken, denk ik, wat je bedoelt. En het is toch vlijend nieuws veel, dat ze dat veel uitleggen. Ik vind, ik vind dat wel goed doen, hoor. Van hun eigen gevoel uitgaan, dat ze zich niet zomaar alles laten vertellen hoe het, hoe het zou moeten. Dat ze dat zelf onderzoeken doen wat waar is en wat niet waar is. Dus dat, uh, ja, dat vind ik wel pas, daar heb ik wel het gevoel van hier in Nederland. En ik denk dat dat ook een taak is. Corine, well, these people actually uh, don't want to be involved. But uh, do you think it's very important that uh, journalism have more engagement with their audience? Um, I think it's always important to have an engagement with your audience, um, but uh, not in the way we used to think it was. We used to think about civil journalism and people uh, uh, making blogs and uh, relying on these blogs on, on your website uh, in order to, to give the street a, a voice. But uh, we discovered, it, it was about 10 years ago or 15 years ago, it was a, a, a trend in the media. But we discovered that it, that's not really uh, journalism because there's no checks and balances. So it's good to 
uh, hear what your audience has to say, but through the journalist, because you have to right. know that what you publish is uh, true, or if it's an accusation that the accused party has a right to respond. Mm -hmm. So um, involvement is uh, is important. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, and we do it through, for example. Uh, uh, through data, um, we monitor uh, much better which of our... That's the good thing of publishing on the on the internet. You see what people read and if they read a story to the end and you can uh, experiment with headlines. You measure how long time they yeah, spent on Yeah, so you see article. what interests people and sometimes it gives you more information. Okay, if this is a story they find so interesting, we should um, uh, make more stories about this subject so it sometimes it leads to profounder uh, journalism, but you should always also rely on your own journalistic instinct. And some of the subjects may not be that popular, but are still important to cover. So it's just it's not only the audience you rely on, but it's part of what you rely on. Mm. And what we also uh, uh, do much more than we used to do is we have opinion polls, or right. we ask our readers. Uh, to uh, about a certain subject to to give their opinion uh, on how traffic works or what are the worst traffic situations in your town. Write us about it. How 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 does the community respond to it? So you have this sort of participating journalism, but the journalist is still the filter. Right. That is very important. Yes, you say. I think yeah. it is. Julie, what's your opinion about this? Should actually journalism engage more with our uh, audience? Uh, I think that journalists and journalism, so the, um, you know, the, the, the outputs of journalism, so whether they be um, digital or print or broadcast, should absolutely be engaged with their communities, with their audiences. And I think using the word communities instead of audiences probably um, underlines what I, what I mean by engagement. Um, I'm not why so is the difference between community and audience so important? I think it's important to consider that you have people um, who would build a community of interest around your content, if you like. So uh, people who are invested in your journalism, not just as subscribers or as people who might pick up uh, the newspaper from a stand uh, or um, tune into a particular broadcast, um, as we heard some of the people uh, in your Vox Pops describing. But think of the people in your community, whether that's a local community or the national community um, of people who are um, engaged with your content. So are they uh, trying to contribute? Are they trying to collaborate with you? What kinds of contributions do they make? Are they trying to provide you with information that is useful, that aids your reporting? Are they trying to um, help correct you if you're wrong uh, in a way that adds value um, rather than attack? Um, so I think th thinking about communities rather than audiences allows us to humanise um, the people who we are there to serve. You know, I firmly believe that journalism is a public service, or it should be, uh, and the public interest journalism, independent, critical journalism are essential uh, to democracy particularly in a world where democracy is in crisis. Um, and I think what we've learned over the past two decades is part, partly driven by this revolution of um, democratising the tools for journalism. So, yes, anyone can start a blog, anyone can start a Twitter account or a Facebook page, um, but we do have this role to play in journalism around curation, which is what um, your colleague was just talking about, and that means editorial judgment, assessing uh, the facts um, and sifting out what's true from what's false and ultimately potentially drawing conclusions. But you do that as a public service and you think of your audience, hopefully, as a community that is, you know, a group of people that you serve as distinct from the people who might just pay for your product. Right. Um, Corina, you actually made the shift from a uh, national uh, newspaper to local newspapers. Uh, you were the deputy editor-in-chief of, uh, of the local uh, national newspaper for 10 years, yes. almost 10 years. Yep. And when you actually um, said farewell, you thanked the subscribers for their support. So do, do you also mean their kind of their engagement? Uh, did you mean that uh, as well? 
Or was it more your personal support? Um, I think both of them. You, 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 you get a bond with the people you work for and with. Because then you time. already get to know them. Like uh, yeah. Julie says, it's the community. You But know how they think, what their interests are. There's a huge difference I, I know now between working for a national uh, daily and a regional daily. We call it regional newspapers. Okay. Um, because uh, now the connection with the readers is it's much, uh, uh, much bigger. So I have um, many times I get readers' letters and emails and uh, all our um, all our journalists very often uh, give their email in the newspaper and they respond to to all the reactions they get and we get ideas through the leaders f through our readers we have many readers who have been uh, uh, with us for uh, t 10 20 or even 50 years so we're a member of their family and they mm. want to be close to us our our offices are in eight Uh, different uh, cities and, and, and uh, villages and people actually go in the office and tell I have a story are you interested so our connection with the audience is much much bigger and that's something regional and local media should uh, do of course absolutely so that differs from a national very much, very much. Uh, the distance is uh, much bigger probably yeah, yeah. for a national yeah. uh, audience yeah. well we, you do get reader letters as well Community. but it's from a different level and mm. different kinds of letters. Mm. Yeah. And do you also uh, get then uh, people who say uh, that, that they want uh, you to write about certain things because that they are missing uh, things in uh, in the newspapers? or uh, They often uh, give us tips on uh, on stories close by or on their uh, pers if they have a personal story or if they know about a new new event or uh, uh, or a scandal uh, uh, and sometimes they complain uh, especially uh, the smaller villages they are used to having a, a small piece written about the village every day and we uh, uh, are uh, uh, approaching it a little bit differently now we want we want still to write about this village but sometimes a bigger story and not every day all these small stories mm. so if they don't see their village at least three times uh, a week in the newspaper, they complain. Mm. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, so you it's know very what direct. you write for. It's, it's very really direct. direct yeah. And during this pandemic, I mean, um, do you also see a difference then uh, from the uh, of the engagement of the community uh, prior to the pandemic? Definitely. Uh, I see a very different role for regional media in this corona crisis. Uh, never... Never ever before, except maybe in the in the in the uh, Second World War, but has a crisis been so effective on everybody in the Netherlands, on their uh, village life, their personal life, their families and their friends, and they really want to know. Uh, well, of course, they want to know what happened, what's happening in politics uh, uh, of the Hague mm. and in Brussels, and but they want to know what's happening in their um, hospital around the corner and their uh, their schools in their village. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, regional media have grown more relevant mm -hmm. and we see it in our subscri subscriptions because mm -hmm. we're really growing. Mm. Um, which and is this is actually a global trend and Julie, you uh, uh, did research on that, right? Uh, the research was called uh, Journalism and the Pandemic and uh, some of the results show that, uh, uh, that there is an increase of 38% of the respondents who are more engaged. Um, and 25% are more positive. Yeah, so you're referring there to the, the first report from um, a global research project that I'm running uh, for ICFJ with the Tau Center for Digital Journalism at Columbia University. So this first report came out less than two weeks ago, um, and it's by myself and uh, also Emily Bell, who's a renowned uh, journalist and uh, media researcher, and Pete Brown, uh, both of whom are from the Tau Center. And we launched this um, global project as a way of trying to map the impacts um, of COVID-19 on journalism. You'll remember uh, that um, at the beginning of the pandemic, several uh, media commentators referred to this event as a, an extinction event for um, the news media. 
So we wanted to see what evidence there was during the first wave of the pandemic um, to uh, at least allow us to describe what these impacts were with data. Um, so we conducted a, a global survey uh, of journalists in seven languages, and this first report was based on the an analysis of the English language um, survey. Uh, the others are still being analysed. But this um, survey found not only uh, that we have a serious crisis, we can't uh, afford to ignore that, we have a crisis of, um, or an exacerbation of an existing crisis uh, connected to the financial viability or unviability of um, the news media. It's uh, falling particularly hard on local or regional media, um, but it's a global trend. Uh, we also find that there is a real mental health crisis evolving within journalism. There's an awful lot of stress uh, experienced by every citizen, uh, but particularly those who are trying to report on a, a very uh, grief-inducing story uh, in many ways. So having to interview people who have suffered or who, have, uh, who are grieving for lost uh, relatives or friends, it's extremely challenging for those people who have to continue to report physically mm. uh, in, in mm. the middle of a pandemic. Right. Um, and so we found that uh, about 30% of our respondents, um, in fact, said that they, they, their news organisations were not supplying the kind of equipment, the basic equipment like masks and hand sanitizer. Right, right. So I just wanted to highlight those points because I think they're very important before we think about um, the role of uh, audiences um, or communities in, in this space and, and how we engage with them. And you're correct, we saw um, an increase in uh, trust that was perceived by the journalists we surveyed. So around uh, over 1,400 um, journalists around the, around the world, English-speaking journalists, said that um, there was a significant uh, increase uh, in trust during the pandemic. And we put that down to the fact that this has been, as um, your colleague uh, said, a, a shared experience, a, an experience that we're living through every other citizen with. Um, but we also saw increases that you highlighted in positive engagement um, with stories. So people uh, being, um, you know, encouraging about uh, the content they were reading. Mm. People also talked about um, their communities being more helpful, you know, actually supplying uh, information, um, additional evidence, fact checking and so on. So there's a lot to um, to be optimistic about that comes from that data as much as there is awful an awful lot of uh, pessimistic news. Right, to absolutely, from that study. yeah. So the pandemic actually um, meant also that people uh, trusted the media more. Um, well, at least that was the view of the journalists we surveyed. So we didn't survey, you know, audiences um, for this study. We surveyed self, the journalists. Right. This but is the <laughs> fact that they are saying that they felt that their audiences were both more engaged, more positive in their engagement, and also, importantly, more trusting, I think, is, um, is something that we can build on. Absolutely. Is that also your experience, uh, Corina, uh, from, the, from your community? Do they trust the newspapers more? Are, uh, um, I don't know. I don't really see a big shift in the way uh, our uh, sources uh, respond to us. I think. I, I think they do realize how important it is to get their stories out. Mm -hmm. So, pr the, but if it's re really trust, because you also see the complot theories. Uh, uh, believers uh, growing in yeah. numbers. Yep. Uh, so there's That's also the a lot of distrust. Downside. Yes. Um, uh, but um, we do see it's get, it's easy to get the stories uh, 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 to get the stories out. I mean, the, the, there are much more stories than we can put in our newspaper or even online. Mm. And we're talking about the shift from uh, offline to online. Has that already happened with the local newspapers well, or the work. regional <laughs> newspapers? Um, sorry. We, well, well I, I would like to uh, explain in the Netherlands you have local newspapers. They are the free newspapers. So they uh, uh, get their income from advertisement and they are having a really hard time now uh, because advertisement is Absolutely, much lower. Yeah. We are um, for 85% of us uh, uh, dependent on our subscribers. So mm. with us, the, the, uh, the income 
part is not such a big problem because also our audience is growing. Um, but you were asking about the shift from uh, shift from, yeah you, we from are offline uh, to off uh, we are working as we call it web first. So our newspaper uh, our our journalists are no longer. Uh, uh, working for this uh, uh, piece of uh, in the newspaper they will fill for tomorrow. They are uh, coming home with stories. They write them as long as they think it's necessary. And we put them uh, online in, in a good uh, uh, manner so that uh, we can see that it reaches our readers. So you have to, to get into a good rhythm. Mm -hmm. So uh, uh, all our operation is now based uh, web first. You on web first and data picture? informed. And at four o'clock in the afternoon, a traditional newspaper editor comes in, he sees what is there and he builds the newspaper. Okay. So uh, we work uh, uh, completely uh, uh, on our uh, digital audience. But we noticed that even though um, we th our focus is different, our journalist, because of the data, is getting more profound. Which mm. is an interesting uh, thing. You you would and you have think, a, you, do you know why? Because we know what people are interested in, and it's not all uh, sex, drugs, and rock and roll. You see that good political analysis, human background stories, information, a, any story about um, uh, retail uh, or uh, uh, the, the big and uh, big and smaller businesses, people are interested in that, uh, and that gives us encouragement. So. It's uh, it's not uh, only the stories about the accidents and crime that mm. are uh, that are getting attention. Uh, actually, the good written, uh, well researched stories are doing very well online. And is it as easy to build uh, a community for offline or as for online, or is it different? It's easier because you get into timelines. Mm. So you get into timelines of people who never read a paper. A newspaper, and if you get into their bubble and they see uh, a, a subject they're interested in, and the next time they see again Leidsdagblad or another of our newspapers, they start to think maybe I should get uh, a subscription because I want to read this. So mm -hmm. uh, that's why I think we are growing again because we reach new people. Mm. Okay, um, thank you for sharing so far. Um, um, we're going to get back to you in a minute, uh, but first we want to uh, go to our other guest from Namibia. She's a photographer, Lee Ann Owage. Uh, every week we're going to invite an international photographer to join us in the series and to give us their view on the future of journalism in the forms of photographs. Lee Ann, welcome. Hi, uh, thank you. How are you and how, where are you? You are in Namib, but you're in Namibia, but you actually uh, work in South Africa, right? Yes, so I'm a visual storyteller from South Africa and I'm currently I've been working in Namibia for the last month on a personal project. Um, and I've been working in villages, living in a Land Rover, so it's quite weird to be in a hotel room again and back in civilization. But I'm happy to be here today and to share a bit about the work I created for this talk today. And then I'll be heading home to Cape Town from tomorrow. Okay. Um, now, we heard uh, Julie Possetti actually mention uh, something about the men mental health crisis. This pandemic is not only uh, just a health crisis, but also a mental health crisis. And your work actually is about that, right? That's correct. Yeah. So um, maybe... So we're going to look at the pictures that you uh, made. Maybe you can uh, share the, the reason behind it, why you took this picture. Sure. Um, so this body of work is titled Black Swan, and the term Black Swan refers to an unpredictable or unforeseen event, typically one with extreme consequences. And that's really what this year has been like for me. Um, the body of work was created after 177 days of hard lockdown in South Africa. And it was shot in the Northern Cape, uh, which is one of the most remote and isolated regions in the country. And with this body of work, I really wanted to look at isolation and my own vulnerability and my own struggles with mental health that was brought on by the pandemic. So I wanted to look at the mental health crisis that journalists are facing 
And the best way to do this was to actually turn the lens on myself and look at my own experience. Um, this was very new for me. I've never had to photograph myself. I've never been inclined to until I was forced to. There was no one left to work with. Um, and it was a very strange experience. Um, looking at my own vulnerability was a very difficult thing and sharing it with the world. But I find that the best way to share global stories is through a personal lens. Um, and it was important for me to really look at the long-term effects of isolation, not only on myself and journalists, but also as a shared experience in terms of what the world is going through. And I think that mental health has always been a difficult topic and something that most people said they can't really relate to. And I find it difficult to believe that at this particular point in history, we are not all having our mental health challenged in at least some way. So I feel like it's a prime opportunity to talk about a very important topic that's a very universal experience at the moment. But it's also very important to look at the way this is sort of a double whammy for photojournalists where we're not only facing financial troubles, but to really look at, you know, there's also online attacks and harassment and really looking at how this is affecting our mental health. Um, as a visual storyteller and extreme introvert, a lot of my interaction with the world comes from photographing people. And I know that my camera gives me this incredibly privileged passport into looking into people's lives and interacting with the world. And once that was taken away, it was very difficult to, to really find these interactions that have become a part of my way of existing. And I found this very challenging. Um, so this Can was really yeah. in a response to that and to really... You know, as photographers, we always hide behind the lens and to really expose my own vulnerability um, through this body of work. Also, why you uh, shot them in black and white instead of using colors to make it yeah. even more... Uh, Absolutely. Um, the black and white also highlights the, you know, the darker headspace that I've been experiencing um, and also just looking at the empty landscapes and... The isolation and although it's a very difficult time I also see this as a blank canvas and an opportunity to really rethink uh, the way we work and we create the way that work is assigned. Um, I think travel bans will be a thing that's with us for quite a while and although it's very challenging it's a fantastic opportunity to employ local storytellers to tell local stories and not to necessarily fly in the best photojournalist from New York, but rather to look at who is living in that community who can really tell that story. So this excites me. I feel like it's an opportunity to really change the way we assign stories. Um, and I'm hoping that this will be the positive that comes out of this experience. Right. So what does the future of photography and photojournalism look like, according to you? Well, I think... It's such a crucial time to be reporting and telling stories and especially independent journalism. I'm excited by the idea of citizen-based journalism and I really do firmly believe that this is an opportunity to make use of local storytellers and to really look at this global experience that we're all sharing. And you know, there's many lenses looking at it, but it really is something that we're all experiencing together and looking at the similarities and I do hope that a lot of these bigger assignments would go to local storytellers and photographers. Right. So uh, what are the projects you're currently working on? So um, for the last month, I've been working on looking at how Alzheimer's and dementia is seen through indigenous lens in Africa. Um, specifically working with local communities in Namibia and looking at how that is understood within the context of African spirituality. What are some of the challenges that comes with this and how to demystify a disease that is often kind of seen within the framework of witchcraft um, oh, really? and how to look at working with communities in terms of providing awareness and education around Alzheimer's and dementia. That's very interesting. I hope you can share some of those pictures also with us. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, it was an absolute pleasure to look at the pictures and uh, talking to you. I wish you all the best for the, for the future. Thank you so much. And maybe until next time. Sure. So let's go back to our uh, subject of uh, the day. Uh, shifting from uh, offline to online. Web first, as you mm -hmm. uh, called it. 
Uh, Julie, uh, you actually um, made another report, What If Scale Breaks Community, where you actually mentioned the fact that uh, there's a correlation between scale and communities. Maybe you can um, elaborate a, a bit more on that? Sure. Um, so this was a project that um, I ran for the Reuters Institute for the study of journalism uh, called the Journalism Innovation Project, and I chose to look at innovation um, not as a sort of product of um, technology, but rather um, getting to the very heart uh, of rethinking what innovation meant. And the report you're referring to was the final in the series, and it looked at um, trying to reimagine engagement uh, in a less um, large-scale way to think of communities and to try and develop deeper and stronger and narrower uh, connections, if you like, with audiences through community engagement. And we looked at three news organisations, uh, Rattler in the Philippines, which is run by uh, the extraordinary Maria Ressa. Maria Ressa, yeah, well known. Yeah, and uh, also uh, Daily Maverick in South Africa, who I'm sure Leanne is um, familiar with, and um, additionally the Quint in India. And we, what we found um, was that there was, in fact, um, benefit to pulling back from large-scale attempts at engagement on the open web. So it's not so much a correlation as a need to decouple um, journalism, if you like, from um, dependency on uh, the platforms, meaning Facebook, Twitter and the other uh, YouTube, whatever platforms you're, you're uh, likely to rely on in journalism. So as important as it is to be able to forge relationships digitally with audiences. We found that in these news organisations that were very much on the front line of, of being under fire um, within the toxic world of online spaces, where, as Leanne pointed out, online violence, particularly against women, uh, particularly against uh, people who were minorities um, or who were the victims of uh, religious bigotry, for example, that it was necessary to pull back to safer spaces to build relationships with audiences online. So we're talking there to an extent about more closed online communities, um, although there might be questions around transparency and accessibility to closed communities. If you have ways of curating your community, so determining who can be a member and who can't be, uh, having you know some more control over the kind of community standards that you want to see in your online spaces, then perhaps that's a way of dealing with um, some of the more uh, vile um, attacks that we've seen, not just against journalists, but against um, the audiences for public interest media as a result of what we refer to as the disinfodemic, so the disinformation that is right. swirling uh, in the context of the COVID-19 pandemic, for example. We right. certainly have seen an escalating uh, disinformation crisis, and that was also a feature that we examined from this earlier study uh, from 2019. Yeah. Um, but we also, and this is where I think it's important to bring this conversation forward to the new challenges we see emerging as a result of COVID-19, where we are being forced as a result of social distancing, if you like, to be more reliant on some digital communities or digital platforms than we might otherwise have been. Mm -hmm. And I think it's problematic if we, um, as news producers, um, seek to rely more heavily on those uh, commercial tech platforms, and particularly Facebook, which um, our research on the Journalism and the Pandemic Project found was um, identified as, as the most prolific vector or enabler of uh, disinformation connected to COVID-19. So one of the things we recommended in that 2019 report was a retreat to physical encounter and more closed communities. Now, when you have a pandemic, um, it's very difficult to pursue the sort of benefits we were starting to see from uh, things such as the performance of journalism in theatres, you know, uh, the kinds of collaborative uh, storytelling that, that came from public town halls, which was a revived idea uh, from the 1990s. So I do think it's important to signal that we have to be aware that it's much easier to weaponize open social media communities uh, whether that's as somebody who's pushing disinformation, foreign actors, populist political figures, um, 
And sorry, to, sorry, 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 uh, Julie. But when you say weaponized, what, what do you mean? Because it have a very has a very negative uh, connotation, right? It is a very negative experience, and and what I mean is, uh, this is something that Maria Ressa says all the time. She talks about the way that the dictatorship in the Philippines, um, and you could make this observation about the way Donald Trump uses uh, Twitter, for example, but the way that the dictatorship in the Philippines under Rodrigo Duterte weaponized or turned the tools of freedom of expression, being the, the social media platforms, into weapons against journalism and right. against the okay. truth. Yep. And so we see it being those platforms being manipulated, but not in just a passive way. It's not just the platforms were you know taken over mm. uh, by these um, by these characters, but allowing this to happen and failing to fix the problem. And so therefore, um, I refer to something called platform capture. So where you find you know journalism is so entrenched and dependent upon these platforms that when we think about reimagining journalism in a post-pandemic world, which I think we can do, and I agree with Leanne, this is a very important opportunity to allow this kind of, uh, you know, reconceptualization of what public interest journalism means. It must be digital, but digital doesn't have to mean um, being completely dependent upon social media platforms. Right. Um, so some of the most innovative journalism that we're seeing around the world that serves the public interest is doing tech journalism-led technology and innovation as a way of trying to right. you know, build, right. build communities uh, that are online that are not as open to abuse as some of these others are. Right. Corina, um, what kind of... Do you use the platforms or do you also have other uh, technology uh, that you're using? Um, we use the platforms, but only to try to get uh, the readers to our own platform. Uh -huh. So um, uh, some of our stories we uh, we post through Twitter, but Twitter is not such an important uh, podium for us. Um, Facebook is um, um, more interesting because they have uh, good algorithms for regional media. So mm. uh, uh, we do get some audience through Facebook, but our most important platform is our own uh, platform. Mm. Um, uh, because that's where we get our new subscribers. Uh, we reach uh, a lot of people through our news newsletters. Uh, you 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 should be as little as possible dependent on on these social platforms. I right. agree with uh, yeah, with totally. the former speaker. And in Asia, WhatsApp is also uh, uh, very important. Mm. Probably, have you uh, done research uh, to that as well? Is that also the case in uh, the Philippines and India? It's very big in India, less so in the Philippines, although it's prevalent. Um, Facebook itself uh, is still the biggest, the um, biggest. And most problematic social platform in the Philippines. Um, one of the problems, though, with retreating to these closed environments, um, particularly on WhatsApp, is we know that disinformation spreads um, within that, those sort of bubbles that are created uh, on WhatsApp, and it's very hard um, because they're not open spaces to see what's happening <laughs> inside them. So when it right. comes to trying to investigate disinformation or to signal, um, you know, the, the, the sort of information uh, influence operations, it's not as easy to, to do that in the context of a, a WhatsApp group in particular. It's a huge problem in India, um, and we've certainly looked at that. So it really then you know, signals um, an important challenge for us, I think, in the international media community. These are challenges that are shared from the Philippines to the Netherlands, from Australia to Finland. You know, there's um, a real set of challenges that have to be answered, I think, in the context of journalism that serves the public interest in a way that is more mission-driven, you know, that accepts and um, is prepared to defend its role uh, as, a, as a feature of a robust democracy. And I think we're seeing elements of that emerge mm. in the context of this shared experience we've had through COVID-19. It's as hard for, you know, me at times to d deduce what's um, true and reliable in an online community as it is for, you know, a friend who's a, a paediatrician or um, a garbage collector, you know, whatever your role is. Uh, right, we're, right. We're all trying to find um, access to factual information. Right. Um, actually, you inv uh, created what you called the innovation wheel, and mm. we we uh, have a, a picture of it. Maybe we can have a look at it. Um, 
and it contains access on which journalism can innovate. Maybe you can uh, tell a li little bit more about uh, the wheel as we see it here. Sure. So this, this relates to the journalism innovation project I mentioned. Um, it is the journalism innovation wheel. So it, it looks at um, audiences or communities should be at the centre and it looks at the ways in which Uh, journalists and news organisations can focus um, on innovation. So through reporting and storytelling, through audience engagement and development, um, and through leadership and management and so on. But the other thing that's not um, evident in that wheel, uh, but was uh, contained in another illustration uh, from a later report, is that I think really the most important way we can innovate is to think about how to innovate when we're under fire. So when we have external threats, whether they are press freedom threats, whether they are the implications of a pandemic, um, whether they are you know, some kind of major uh, journalism safety risk, we have to be able to think about how we respond creatively um, in a time of crisis. And I think that's never been truer than in the pandemic which as um, I think Corina referenced is probably the first time, certainly in Western developed democracies since World War II, where there has been such a um, significant um, you know, convergence of challenges uh, in the course of the pandemic. So creative around um, responding ethically to challenges and crises, this can be a form of innovation. And I think we need to be less kind of you know, tech driven and more journalism driven Um, while thinking about the role that technology can play as we try and serve our communities. Hmm. Corina, what do you think about this innovation wheel and the access? It, uh, I noticed a lot of things I, I recognize. <laughs> right. um, uh, I think um, uh, the audience engagement is really important. Uh, the most important thing we should do is invest in our storytelling, um, uh, making our stories Uh, 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 better mm. um, uh, um, every day and, and working really hard to see that they are correct because we we need this trust. Um, this trust need, needs to be profound and uh, based on uh, uh, our work. Mm -hmm. So investing in storytelling is one of the most important things journalists can do and, and all the, the rest is uh is um uh, marketing and and leadership and but but getting the best stories out improving mm. your journalism finding new ways to report mm. uh that's that's our biggest uh, mm. uh challenge uh, challenge yeah um do you agree julie yeah i think um there's i mean everything is tied up all of the challenges are tied up in uh our ability to accurately, reliably inform our audiences with powerful narratives that travel, um, that stand out from the kinds of viral disinformation, um, you know, the sort of fire hose of falsehoods as Jay Rosen refers to one of our biggest challenges. How do we allow our stories, our reporting, um, that, that which we curate as, as journalists um, in collaboration, hopefully, with experts uh, in the field um, of whatever topic we're investigating. That, I think, is the most essential challenge. But in order to do that, we have to address these other uh, threats and challenges. So ensuring that uh, public interest media is financially viable and sustainable, um, ensuring that we, you know, we're serving our communities in ways that allows them to value truth and not be so overwhelmed by disinformation and misinformation that they just give up believing in anything. I mean, this is essential to trust. We talk about trust in journalism, but it's beyond journalism. It's trust in information. You know, what, what can people believe and what can they not believe? And if they feel they can't believe anything, they'll just stop seeking any kind of truth. So yeah, yeah. I think all of this is bound up. Um, but, you know, we have... One thing very clear before us at the moment, and it's really in stark, um, you know, reality because of the pandemic, and that is the need to ensure that we support critical public interest journalism that holds governments and other actors, big tech platforms, you know, whoever, to account, um, and also to ensure that we're able to produce content that informs, that improves lives, that serves communities and, you know, gets back to basics of sort of the mission of journalism, which is partly rooted in um, serving 
communities, but partly rooted in serving communities in a way that advances social justice, for example. Um, and we need to do that by being more diverse uh, and more engaged with, with our communities, being part of those communities, which and, as yeah. um, Karuna has said, is, right. I, mean, I, I right. started in, in regional public broadcasting and went through to a sort of national and international career. So I did the reverse uh, to what Karuna's uh, done. And absolutely, everything I learned um, in that local space of having people knocking on my window, you know, wanting to engage about story A or story B that I produced um, and, and feeling a sense, you know, being live to air on the ABC in Australia when a bushfire was bearing down on my community and, and really recognising what it meant to be the only voice that they could hear on their battery-powered radio while they were wondering which route to take to get away from the fire. I mean, this is the essence of right. what journalism is, and I think that's well worth fighting for. Right. I agree. But, Corine, do you agree? Definitely, definitely. Okay. And we in Netherlands are very lucky that we have lots of newspapers that are financially healthy and don't need government support. But uh, what you just said, uh, it's vital for a society, for a democratic society, to have good national media, but definitely also regional media. Viable yeah. media is uh, essential, absolutely. Uh, and sadly, in a lot of countries, that is not the case at the moment, no. But are you still optimistic, Julie, about the future of journalism? Yeah, I think um, I can't stop being optimistic um, for, for uh, reasons that Leanne partly uh, pointed to, um, what um, Karina is, is talking about, what I'm describing here. When somebody like, I keep coming back to Maria Ressa, I was just on a webinar with her and um, she is a good friend and she was originally just you know, a research subject and a colleague, but um, she talks about this opportunity that exists to reinvent journalism as really a, you know, a, a once in a, a century uh, possibility. And I think if somebody who is facing you know, eight separate legal cases and who's um, already been sentenced to jail, potentially to spend 100 years behind bars, who is uh, being threatened, you know, on a daily basis um, in the Philippines for doing her job. If she can be optimistic about reinventing a, a form of journalism that's community-centred and mission-driven and uh, all about um, serving democracy, then I, I think the rest of us... <laughs> Have to. have to find a we way. We have to, and yes. A I totally between agree. between optimism and being able to point to solutions. I think we're still in the phase or of perseverance. Yeah. 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 But, but hopeful that there, you know, that, that there has to be um, a series of solutions. There's not going to be one, but a series of different um, possibilities that will allow us to go on. That's and is online be... community or the community, I know that Rappler actually has a huge community, international. Um, yeah. And can they actually influence that position? Uh, make sure that, uh, put pressure on the government or other uh, international bodies? Well, I, I mean, I think in, that, in those reports, uh, particularly that the one about um, communities, uh, community building while under fire, which is one of the ones you referred to, where Rappler was... Uh, a key case study, and now even more, um, we can see that the work that Rattler did trying to build communities connected to their reporting has really paid off because as much as they came under fire and continue to come under fire, uh, particularly online and particularly from the Duterte government, they have built such loyalty, not just among formal members, but within uh, communities, they, their, their communities have helped fund their legal defence. You know, hundreds of thousands of US dollars have been given by their, their communities, their audiences, as a way of allowing them to continue doing what they're doing. Um, and certainly the international community um, that has been, you know, observing what Maria Ressa and her colleagues have done over the past 10 years in trying to reinvent journalism in, in an online environment, um, we have been moved, uh, you know, I'm one of the three uh, leaders of the Hold the Line Coalition, which is a coalition designed to support Maria and Rappler through this particular crisis that they're facing. And one of the reasons that's proven so popular, I think, and garnered so much support is because we see in the Philippines, in Maria, 
you know, the saying in English, there but the grace of God go I, which means, you know, we are all facing challenges and we can see the way in which so quickly democracy and press freedom collapsed in the Philippines. We can see it well and truly under fire in the US, you know, just, just in the lead up to the totally, US election. Totally, totally, right. Yeah, mm. yeah. Uh, Corinne, of course, this is a totally different scale in the Netherlands, mm -hmm. um, uh, facing uh, the threats uh, that Maria Ressa actually faces. Um, but do you understand? Or do you also think that uh, your community has influence on the future of the local or the regional newspapers? You mean internationally? No, here in the Netherlands. Um, well. I just like to respond to what was sure. said before. Uh, what I noticed, even working in uh, countries where there is no democracy, I, I, I worked uh, in Russia for four years. Um, you always see people who are uh, brave and who feel the urge to report, no matter how difficult the circumstances. And the good thing about these um, uh, online communities is uh, different from 30 years ago. There's, in every country, there's people who know what's going on outside their uh, their their uh, their own country. So um, there's always a base for critical journalism. Mm. Uh, so that's a hopeful thing. Especially in repressive countries, you mean? Uh, e even in repressive countries, you always see people stand up and want to get the world out. So that's Look at Belarus at the a moment. hopeful remark. And, and seeing what is happening in my own uh, region right now, well, you do notice that, uh, like I said in the beginning, uh, uh, people are more respectful now looking at their uh, uh, regional uh, uh, medium because they see, they want to know uh, what their local what's leaders are doing yeah. and what's going on around the corner. Right, right. Um, I heard somebody said that uh, if local newspapers actually uh, vanish, then immediately you see an increase of salary of majors and other public uh, holders, officials. Um, that is probably not the case in the Netherlands, but uh, it has an immediately effect. That is uh, also what you said, uh, uh, Julie, that uh, media ha and journalists have an obligation to hold power holders to account, right? Um, what is your uh, vision on the future of journalism? I'm optimistic, but that's in my nature. Uh, but um, uh, definitely, um, I think uh, journalism has a, a better position now than it had 10 years ago, uh, because um, it, uh, uh, 10 years ago, it, we were struggling against uh, free news everywhere on the internet. And now people are starting to realize, also thanks to uh, the music industry and the movie industry, that uh, uh, not everything is for free. So good news, good journalism is something you need to pay for. And I think it's something you see internationally uh, and it's, it's, it's very positive. And it's growing. It's growing, yeah. And we reach new audiences. Mm. There are also younger people who are willing to pay a, a dollar uh, uh, a week to get their online news from a trustworthy uh, uh, regional medium. Okay. Is that also uh, your experience, Julie? Um, yes and no. <laughs> um, I think it, internationally we're seeing uh, certainly the collapse of advertising. Uh, you know, that's escalated dramatically during the pandemic uh, and that is hitting places where there had been a continued over-reliance on traditional advertising as a revenue stream. Um, those news organisations that seem to be doing better are the ones that uh, have diversified and have uh, maybe blended membership with some other kinds of um, commodities like uh, leveraging their research skills, you know, um, to provide those sorts of services, which is something else that uh, Rappler does. So there are, you know, there are different, different models. Um, I don't think at the end of this pandemic we're going to sit back and see a revival at scale. I think what we will see is hopefully um, a more focused, uh, you know, reconstruction of what public interest journal journalism looks like. 
uh, in a digital era as we've tried to figure out um, what this new information ecosystem should look like, you know, with regulation in combination with improved ethics uh, within the online uh, platform community, so the, the big tech companies taking some responsibility. Um, so I'm hoping that this is a kind of reckoning that results in the survival of a diverse range of media organisations. I fear that there will be far too many good or great um, community or local journalism, uh, regional journalism initiatives um, in ashes uh, around the world. And I also fear that, um, you know, we'll be left with four or five big international news brands and then a smattering of um, startups that uh, are not necessarily sustainable medium to long term. So I think what we need to be focused on now is taking the lessons that we can learn from the studies that are underway around audiences' experiences of quality journalism and ensure that we're putting those into practice before we regroup in a year's time to see what's left. Right, um, right. Yeah. So that does take optimism. Um, solutions hopefully will come. Mm. So it's a, it's a, it's a bit bittersweet, I would say, your yeah. uh, vision on uh, journalism. Um, thank you so much for sharing. Uh, thank you, Julie Pesetti and Corina de Vries for uh, being with us in this edition. Uh, this was the 17th edition of Emerging Stories, the talk show where we talk about the importance and the future of journalism. And next week, we will be back with a new episode. This time, we're going to talk about the safety of journalism. And we actually touched upon that uh, already. Because next week, it's uh, Impunity Day, 2nd November. So, uh, I hope you will join us uh, then again. Uh, thank you for now for watching. If you want to see more live cast of Pakhuis de Zwijger, take a look at their website for the program. For now, have a good evening and goodbye.